93.3 FM, The Source. All right, 25 minutes before 11 o'clock. That means we have 13 hours and 25 minutes left in today, Robin. Yes, we do. That, I mean, in the year. That, <laughs> yeah. That means the year is almost over. And I know a lot of you have made up your mind that, okay, I'm going to start eating right. I'm going to start doing what I need to do with my health, and I'm going to make smarter choices. I, If you've been listening to this show for a long time, or any time, really, you've heard us talk to a lot of authors who had diet books. You've never heard somebody talk with, about the subject of when to eat food. I don't think we've ever had this topic. And looking through the book that Dr. Roizen has written, we're going to talk to Dr. Michael Roizen right now. Um, he's been with us before, by the way, but the book tells you what to eat when. Can I just read a little bit from what it says? This is a New York Times bestselling author, first of all, Dr. Roizen. He's going to talk in a second. What if eating two cups of blueberries a day could prevent cancer? Yeah. What if drinking a kale-infused smoothie could counteract missing an hour's worth of sleep? When is the right time of day to eat that chocolate chip cookie? And would you actually drink the glass of water if it meant sleep, uh, giving, skipping the gym? I'm reading from the Amazon listing, by the way. Uh, in this book, uh, Dr. Royzen reveals how the food choices you make each day and when you make them can affect your health, your energy, your sex life, your waistline. All right, I got everybody's attention. Let's say good morning, Dr. Roizen. It's an honor to have you on our show. Good morning, doctor. It's great to be on, Larry. Thank you. This is, um, it's, it's very rare. When you do a show as long as Robin and I have, it's very rare to have somebody with a topic we've never touched on before. But mm -hmm. this is definitely unique. Well, the reason is that the science is new. That is... Over the last about seven years, we've gotten the science in animals, and over the last, oh, maybe a year and a half, two years, the science has been verified in humans that when you eat is important. We used to think a calorie was a calorie was a calorie, um, but it turns out we handle calories much more efficiently, meaning we burn them easier in the morning than in the evening. If we're normal, meaning if we have a normal blood sugar in the morning, by the evening, most of us are pre-diabetic. That means we tend to store fat in the evening from calories, whereas the morning meal tends to burn off and not be uh, causing weight gain. Okay, so just based on what you just said right there, if I were to only hear that, and I was gonna try to do something you, that you might consider extreme, I wouldn't eat any other time but the morning, right? Um, that's right, but that'd be pretty extreme. So what right. you want to do is eat when the sun is up and not eat when the sun isn't up and eat more early and less later. And you're right about um, having a, a, what we call time-restricted eating, meaning only eating when the sun is up. So I have a question about in, in uh, what's the word uh, for animals? Uh, not intuition. Well, instinct. Well, instinct. Do animals instinctively know, and I don't mean dogs and cats because they're domesticated, but I mean, do animals in the wild know when to eat? Like, there's an instinct? Um, you know, we don't know that because almost all of the studies are in humans. And when you give animals free access to food, that is, when you provide it 24-7, as it is with humans available, the animals gain weight and develop heart disease and other things early. One of the, the most interesting studies is in fruit flies. Fruit flies are the best model of heart disease we have for humans. They have a heart, you know, it's hard to study them, but they have a heart. Wow, wow. They, <laughs> they, their heart is exactly of the same structures as human heart. Really? And they develop atherosclerosis just like we do, et cetera, and hardening of the heart arteries. And if they're given free access to food in, in a 24-7, they eat it, develop obesity, heart failure, they don't fly as well, and they die earlier than, and with much more disease and chronic disability than the fruit flies that are only given food uh, for 12 or less hours a day. Uh, you so, talk um, 
Oh, so yeah. I don't think they have the instinct. They have an instinct to survive just like we do, and, and we think calories are good to survive with. Uh, you talk about stereotyping uh, different foods. That was an eye-opener for me. That's right. So um, one of the interesting things is as you switch to this, you learn that you can cook dinner so we have more time in the evening, but eat it for breakfast. And, in fact, there's some real advantages if you like pasta um, then the pasta in the morning becomes much more fiberish because it's cold. It's been in the refrigerator overnight um, and use more calories to digest than the pasta you eat at night, which ends up the, the difference being, and, and I'll, I'll go over one of the wonderful studies in a second, but it means that, that cook at night, eat dinner for breakfast. So I often will have salmon burgers for breakfast um, which I did this morning as well. is my favorite breakfast. Really? And, nice. and And you make it the night before, just so it's ready. Is that, sure. that that's what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, that's exactly. So you, we all have time. Usually, I mean, our, beg- our biggest time to cook is in the evening, the way America is structured. You know, in, in Germany and some of the European countries, they eat their biggest meal at breakfast in Germany or, or in, in Spain at lunch. And in the Spanish study, one of my, my favorite studies, because they had about 400 women who were trying to lose weight, and they gave them their biggest meal before 2 p.m. or after 3 p.m. So it was still the same number of calories. The ones who ate it before 2 p.m. lost 25% more Is weight that right? wow. than the ones who ate it after 3 p.m. So same number of calories. Just eating at a little different time uh-huh. change their metabolism a great deal. Uh, so I want to make sure we get to some of the details. Obviously, the book is the real details. But can I ask a real broad question just to start, I guess, to, to be next? Do we need to have an entire chart, for example, of every food? Or can we group them and say, like, all all green vegetables should be eaten at this time of day or all all proteins should be eaten at this time of day is the, can we group them like that well we don't you don't even have to get that grouping but yes that's right so the more you eat um, uh, essentially a plant-based diet the healthier it is and if you will the the early bird special we used to laugh at the early bird special but it actually is a great way so you eat half of the early bird special or eat just the salad at dinner, take the rest home and eat it for breakfast is a really good way of doing it. And then if you wanted to group food, um, protein and fat is great in the morning, but for those people who like pasta, especially cold pasta, it's better to have it in the morning or at noon. So you can group foods, but it, but you actually don't need to. All you have to do is think of, um, uh, eating more early and less later. How about adding different spices to foods? Because different cultures have different spices, and their bodies are body weight. They're they're smaller, or uh, if if they have more spices. That no, that's exactly right. You want to. Th- this is not a deprivation type diet. It's it's saying if we eat what we normally eat now, but eat it more in the early, less later. And spice it so it's the it's the most enjoyable for you. You want to make it the most enjoyable you can have. So spices are a great way of adding variety and adding enjoyment to food. So we're, we're I'm strongly in favor of that. And so one of my favorite snacks is roasted chickpeas. But I put a lot of, of either rosemary or garlic or... Um, hmm. if you will, curcumin on the, on the chickpeas that you roast. It's really easy, but it's a great snack. So you take a, you can take uh, a, a uh, can of chickpeas, dry them out on paper towel, um, then put them on a roasting pan or mix them with a little olive oil and your favorite spice, uh, uh, cumin and garlic combined. And then roast them for at uh, 425 for 10 to 15 minutes, sometimes longer, rolling them, you know, shaking the pan uh, in the oven once or twice. It's a great way of making a snack that's healthy and has that spice in it that, that, that makes it really enjoyable. So 
That's right, Robin. So I have, I have a question for you based on Penn Gillette, the, the uh, magician. He, he lost some weight, and he, uh, he said he has these days that are rare and appropriate. That's when he uh, doesn't stick to whatever diet he's got himself on. So, but he has rare and appropriate. So, for example, his daughter's birthday, he has no problem having birthday cake and ice cream and whatever because it's rare. He doesn't have it that often, and it's appropriate because it's a birthday. So my question for you about based on that is the social part of eating for example tonight um is probably a lot of people going to go out and have a party tonight and there's probably going to be food there so would you skip the morning meal that you're doing with this program so that you could then have it later on since you know that's coming up as a social event well I, we the rare and appropriate is exactly right we have four i i have four what I call splurge days or four regular, if you will, four different days, and one of which is my birthday and one of which is our anniversary and one of which is usually Thanksgiving, and then I see the other one. But, so tonight, what you, you know, you, you'd want to eat earlier so you're not hungry later uh, okay. and you're not tempted to eat a lot later if you, this isn't one of your splurge days. So if it is a splurge day, enjoy gotcha. it. okay. You, Usually, uh, so you. What the interesting thing is when you switch to eating early, you aren't hungry late, and and a lot of people who eat late at night, meaning the late night, like uh, snacks, the hunger goes away. So we've done this both in our own group of uh, study patients as well as um, from other studies that you really do lose the hunger, and that's the, the real joy of eating what, what we call the when way. Uh, you have your book split up into uh, different sections uh, that run the gamut from what to eat when you have a, a lot of stress. That's one of my downfalls right there. Or if you're training for marathons or even those savage races. That's exactly right. So we have the beginning of the book, talks about the overall data in, in and again we we you know the the uniqueness of what we try and do is to make the book really engaging and fun to read so even guys will read it but it is to um <laughs> talk, to, to talk about the strategy and how you switch and then the later part of the book is is what national geographics really started out um thinking we were doing with the book is what do you eat if you have a digestive problem? Or what do you eat if you have pain? Or what do you eat if you're on a first date? Or what do you eat? Um, so it's all kinds of, of situations. What do you eat if you're going for an interview? What do you eat uh, at a golf match, for example, or at a football game? So it has all kinds of things like that in it, including all the, the medical situations such as stress, which is um, one of the, the most common, if you will. So you're right, Robin. Doctor, can you talk to the people who are not on a diet, um, who are who they're fine, their weight is perfect, and, and but they're not listening to you right now because of weight loss. They've got that under control, but maybe they've got something else going on. Maybe they're sluggish. Maybe they want more energy. Would this also help them? Yeah, what, what is amazing with this, you know, I was a real skeptic before I tried it and then before we tried it with a group of um, people um, and what I was the skeptic was that eating in a time restricted fashion meaning you're not eating from say 7 p.m. till 7 a.m. or I don't eat till 10 a.m. so from 7 a 7 p.m. till 10 a.m. if you don't eat that's 15 hours and what you find is you have enormous bursts of energy like you were 20 years younger. And so it, it, and the, the, uh, the amazing thing is it also normalizes a lot of what we call the markers, the biomarkers of aging. So you look at your inflammation level or you look at even cholesterol or blood pressure levels, and by doing the, the eating earlier, and eating more earlier, less later, and eating in that, that period where you don't eat for 12 hours or even more, uh -huh. you really are um, changing uh, your markers of aging and changing your energy level. So it works for, for everyone, including all those not trying to 
to lose weight. The other thing that, that we don't have long-term studies on it, but the other thing what we do have is that you end up elongating the telomeres on your stem cells. So stem cells are important for repair. In other words, if you have a heart attack, what happens to repair your heart is you try and get to the hospital soon enough to restore blood flow. That restores some of the cells that are intermittent that haven't died yet. But really what it does is it allows the stem cells, if you get there within a couple hours, your stem cells from your uh, bone marrow come in and repair those are the replacement. We learned that with transplant. Really? So if you transplant a female heart into a male, when the if that heart, that female heart has a heart attack, the stem the cells that repair it are the male's own stem cells. So you get to a, heart, a hospital soon enough after a stroke or heart attack for two reasons, to restore blood flow, but it also, if you've got enough stem cells, they come in and repair it if you get there fast enough as well. So there are two reasons. And what this does in, now we've only got three years studies on this, as I said, it's relatively new science, is you um, restore or increase the number of stem cells you have um, so you have a chance of doing repairs for much longer. Really? When, we can't do, when you can't do repairs, when you, you end up with non-repairing, not enough stem cells to repair you, and we, usually, we thought you had a finite limit of that till the recent studies with this um, diet, but until um, on this way of eating, it's not really a diet, until this right. way of eating, right. um, when, when the studies have been done over three years, we, can, we see a uh, sizable, about a 20% increase in telomere length, which means you get about 20% more replications of your stem cells so that you can repair things for about 20% longer. Oh, my God. So we don't have long-term... We don't have real long-term studies on it. We've only got three-year studies on it, but it's very consistent. Is that explained in the book? It is. Yep. Okay. So and what, and what do you call is, telomere? Telomere? Those are called telomeres. Um, and so if you look in the index, it may not be in the index because our index is not perfect, but it's in the book. Okay. So I got to tell you, the, the indexing is now done by, it used to be done by real pros back in when we started writing books in the 1999s. Um, but now it's all done by computer, and the computers oh, no. aren't, as good as the, aren't as good as the pros were, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, when a person is pregnant, I know I gave birth to my son and daughter uh, 39 and 41 years ago, and each pregnancy, my body was craving different kinds of foods, and I didn't put a uh, stop on anything uh do the women that get pregnant today do they still have those cravings and do they limit what they have or do they just go for well, it you know they have the cravings and unfortunately if you look at what's happened in our pattern is um too many of pregnancies are in women who gain too much weight during pregnancy which has a long-lasting effect. We call it an epigenetic effect. In other words, it's not changing the genes, but it's changing which of the genes in your offspring are on or not, meaning they get um, genes that crave more food, too. And so it's really important. So remember, if you're pregnant, you want to eat for 1.1, not for 2. So what do I mean by that? You want to eat 10% more. The, the calorie expenditure is only 10% more. It's not uh, 20%. But that makes sense. There, you, yeah. we, do have a, we do have a chapter on uh, both what to eat when you're pregnant and what to eat in trying to get pregnant. There's, there's a lot of data now on the foods that you should eat when you're trying to get pregnant. Um such as you want to make sure you get enough folic acid in the food. You want to make sure um, that you have omega-3s, the um, walnuts and flaxseed and fish, in the point of trying to get pregnant as those increase the chances of getting pregnant, as do nuts, which have a, a ton of uh, the micronutrients you need to, to, both for men and women, to have the swim sper the sperm swim faster 
and to have uh, eggs that that are more fully uh, have more full nutrients in them. Uh, the book is called What to Eat When, and it is written by Dr. Michael F. Royson, who's on the phone, along with Michael Krupain. Um And uh, I wanted to uh, give it away, so I have a copy of the book. Uh, the, w- the whole premise here, for, if, if you're just tuning in, is that when you eat is as important as what you eat. And, and, I, and even though we focused on when you eat during this interview, I, I think you would agree that what you eat has to also be a consideration. So that's not what your book is about, but we need to somehow grasp that we shouldn't eat this and we should eat that, right? I mean, or is there anything that's taboo? Like, like you said, no, 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 no. What you what you're saying is what we talk about is um, that when you eat is as important as what you eat, but what you eat is important clearly, and what you really want to do is eat. Um, as much plant-based as you can, and with healthy fats, meaning the odd omegas, omega-3, which are flaxseed and canola oil and avocados, and omega-9, which is extra virgin olive oil, um, those being your main fats, and avoiding processed uh, meats, especially red meat, and um, egg yolks. So the, and, and the, the other point is to eat complex carbohydrates, not, not ones with simple sugar or added syrups or simple carbs that raise your blood sugar too fast. So mm-hmm. there's really only four things to avoid. That is foods with saturated fat. Um, and it's not because of the saturated fat. It's because of the proteins, the carnitine, lecithin, and choline that come with them. We explain that in the book as well. Um, it's, in other words, it's not the saturated fat that's bad for you. That's a little bad but that's literally 5% of the effect. 20, 19, if you will, 20th or 95% of the effect is the carnitine, lecithin, and choline it, that comes with those in egg yolks and in red meat. Um, and pork, unfortunately, is a red meat too that changes the bacteria inside your gut that cause inflammation. Ah, okay, so, okay. basic things is avoid foods with saturated fat, avoid simple sugars, avoid added syrups, and avoid simple carbs. Everything else is great and you find out what you love and then spice it as Robin said in a way that makes it exciting and flavorful yeah. and great enjoyment and that you can enjoy in the morning. I'm telling you, this is good information. Let me give the book away. Robin has another question. First, I'm to give the book. Good morning. You've got the book. Who's this? Edwina. Edwina. You know where we are, right? Yes. Okay. The book is waiting for you. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm sorry, Robin. And uh, you, uh, you, you have seen this happen in uh, real life because you have your patient, you, you have had your patients try what you were talking about, and they were able to turn their lives around. That, that's exactly right. And in fact, uh, I'll tell you, since you're you're the first show I've been on with this book, um, that on uh, January second, watch the Dr. Oz show. We have. Uh, 40 people who've been on it for um, a month will be on the show on uh, January 2nd. You'll see some of them. Oh, really? And what results they've had. Right? Oh, oh, my gosh. Okay. Uh, and you can also get the book on Amazon. Do you have a different website you want to recommend? Uh, the other website, in Amazon is great, but um, is the When Way, W-H-E-N-W-A-Y.com, WhenWay.com, and it has a lot about the book on it and a lot about uh, recipes and menus relating to this. I think you're changing people's lives, Doctor. The phone lit up, by the way. Uh, you, you've definitely got our interest. Dr. Michael Royzen, Happy New Year. Thank you for being on the air with us today. Happy New Year, Larry, and thanks, Robin, too. All right, excellent. We'll be right back. Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 963 FM, The Source. Fox News, I'm Chris Foster. Massachusetts Democrat Elizabeth Warren announces in a video she's launching an exploratory committee for president. Most of us want the same thing, to be able to work hard, play by the same set of rules, and take care of the people we love. That's the America I'm fighting for. Forming the committee allows her to legally start raising money for a campaign. 
Some people on the other side of the world, like there in New Zealand, are already celebrating New Year's Day. In New York City, there's heavy security for the party tonight in Times Square. Counterterrorism.